smoke wagon right there. Where did I go wrong? 902 here on Mornings with Lone Star, Lone Star Community Radio, rlonestar.com. Sitting here for Meet the Candidates with my co-host, Nathan Arizotti. We're about to kick it off. Nathan, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty dead gum good, sir. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. You're on the computer right now. If you have questions for our guests today, just visit Montgomery County Lifestyle on Facebook. Like them and send a message through that. And we're hanging out with J.D. Lambright, your county attorney in the studio. J.D., how are you doing? I'm doing great and great to be here today. Yeah, it's a beautiful day. It's a little chilly, but it's going to hit the high 70s today. So that's going to be an interesting day in Montgomery County, that's for sure, because early voting. Early voting started an so, hour and three minutes ago, right? That's exactly Eight right. Uh, just to let you guys know, early voting is going to go all the way through next week. All you got to do is go online, mctx.org slash election, for all your polling locations and times, and then, of course, lead up to the March 1st vote. Uh, J.D. Lambright's running for county attorney again. That is, is correct. Re-elect, I'm, re-election. Re-elect. I'm finishing up my first term uh, as we speak here. And uh, so far you did okay. You weren't in the papers on negative stuff, so I think you're doing all right. Well, thank you very much. We <laughs> have really tried to do the right thing for the right reason in the right way, and uh, uh, I, th- I think that's what's proven to be the case over the last three years. The uh, county attorney folks, what they do is, or what they represent are the people of Montgomery County who work for the county. Yes, we are essentially the chief legal advisor for all of our county government, which uh, amounts to around 2,200, 2,300 employees. So we're the legal advisors for our county judge, our commissioner's court, all of our elected officials, all of our department heads, really all of our employees. And and our largest client amongst all of those are law enforcement, since uh, approximately one-third or a little more than a third of all of the county employees work in law enforcement. So big part of our business. Yeah, that's something I'm learning more and more every time we do meet the candidates, how large this county is and how involved they are and with all the cities around Montgomery County. Uh, like that percentage kind of changes a little bit, but it's around the seventy mid-70% of the county is the counties, not just the cities. So uh, those are your, your people. That, that is correct. One thing that is is unique about Montgomery County, even though we're around a half a million population, most of Montgomery County lies in unincorporated areas. Uh, like the city of Conroe is the largest incorporated area with around, I think, 70-ish thousand. But the Woodlands is not incorporated. That's part of the county uh, as, as well. So th- that's one reason the county's services are so extensive as they are, because the county is providing a lot of services where more normally you might have more incorporated areas so you would have city police departments and city other you know other city departments doing that and with your first term can you tell me how the county's doing i think the county is doing very well of course this whole county in particular is is thriving Mm -hmm. uh growing like crazy which continues to put demands on my office and all of the services the county provides but uh, we haven't added anyone in the county attorney's office and it's been constant. At, I have a staff of about 30, and it's been that way for quite a number of years. So we, we have really uh, tried just to bring in, bring in the best and brightest and really get subject matter experts in every area where we work. What is this award that you, uh, you your office, has won two years in a row? Well, uh, in my first year in office in 2013, uh, we were named Department of the Year. And that's not some in-house popularity contest or something like that. A lot of county departments are nominated, and then it's an outside group or groups that are not even county employees that make those determinations to try to move the the politics and the biases and the friendships from us, from the process. And uh, being named Department of the Year, that had never happened in the history of the county attorney's office. And then specifically what you mentioned then in, in 2014, uh, one of my employees was named Employee of the Year. And as I mentioned earlier, that's out of around 2,200, 2,300 employees. One of mine was chosen as the Employee of the Year by that same kind of process. And then I was in- incredibly honored and blessed in 2014 that I was named Boss of the Year for all of Montgomery County and uh, and then repeated that in 2015. And I'm told that has never happened either, that back-to-back wins and that. But I think that's really a testament to what we're doing in the office, the kind of people we brought in, and the services we're providing to our client. And, and I hear that from our clients. I mean, hardly a day goes by that our clients aren't telling us how we have so upped the bar in providing effective, efficient legal advice to them. That's what we're here to do. It's kind of impressive, too, because really what you do is behind, not behind the scenes, but it's not something that is in the newspapers, really, unless someone's in trouble. 
uh, and especially just kind of mediation and just being there for the county employees. Uh, what, the reason I'm bringing this up and it's just kind of I'm just curious is when you're running for county attorney, there's not typical political platforms you can stand on saying I'm going to change this, I'm going to do this, uh, because when you took office, now you're going to your second term, hopefully. Hopefully you're already doing a good job, so you're not trying to say, like, oh, we need to get rid of the last guy because it's you. Mm-hmm. So what, what can you tell me as a person running for an like, – because you need people to vote for you coming up today and all the way through March. So what can you tell those people right now why they need to vote for you if – you know, what, 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 sorry, what grounds do people need to know about why they need to vote for you? Well, that, that's a very good point because I learned during my campaign, and I've seen it still throughout the last three years – Very few people know what the county attorney or the CA, as we call it, does. Most people have a general idea of what the district attorney, the DA, does. And essentially, you know, uh, prosecuting bad people and putting them away in in prison. But they really don't know what we do. And my office, we are really more like five law firms under one roof. We uh, have got five different divisions, and that's what I mentioned, where I've put a subject matter expert in charge of each one of those. We have a staff of about 30, and about half of those are lawyers, uh, about 10 or so legal assistants, and two police investigators that work for me. So we prosecute all the juvenile crimes in the county, which are children between the ages of 10 and 16, and that's all the way from Class B misdemeanor up to capital murder. And we've had two capital murders uh, that we've prosecuted since I've been in office, we also, the attorneys for Child Protective Services, have three attorneys in there protecting uh, the, the children of our community. Also, uh, as you can imagine, the amount of real estate transactions that the county government is involved in, leases, airport leases, uh, sale of facilities, acquiring property to build roads, bridges, and whatever like that. So we handle the legalities of all of those real estate transactions. We also have a litigation division, and we handle all of the litigation for the, the county government. Most of the time, we are the defendant in those. Uh, every time the county gets sued, our elected officials get sued, department heads, sheriffs, uh, and the deputies are probably more often the target of lawsuits, which is a real shame. But we vigorously defend all those, and that's one thing where we've made a tremendous difference because I kept hearing about that during the campaign is – is a lot of the law enforcement felt that the county attorney's office didn't have their backs. And uh, they uh, they see now we really do since I came into office. And then the last uh, arm in my office is what I call government affairs. And that's kind of everything else, all the labor and employment issues, uh, contract issues, issuing legal opinions. It's, it's kind of everything that's not in one of those other areas, open records requests, uh, of which since I've been in office, the county has uh, pro- uh, processed more than 35,000 open records requests. So another big part of the business. We're sitting here with J.D. Lambright, your county attorney who's looking for re-election right now, early voting starting. You can visit him online or see what's going on over the county attorney's office at mctxcao.org uh, for more information. We'll be back. We're going to learn more about the history of who J.D. J.D. Lambright is. If you don't mind, we're going to learn about you, where you grew up, and all that kind of good stuff. I'm sitting here with Nathan Arizani of Montgomery County Lifestyle. If you've got a question for J.D. or Nathan, just go to Montgomery County Lifestyle on Facebook and ask it through there. We'll be back after this short break. Let's do some music right now. Here's some Zane Williams with She Is. All right. Man, the damn quail's right there. Just a little while. It is 920 here on Mornings of Lone Star. Hanging out in the studio. Coming up at 10 o'clock, of course, is the Cindy Cochran Show, and then our normal programming after that. Uh, just to let folks know we're going FM. That's right, 104.5, 106.1 uh, here on Lone Star Community Radio now. That's the new name. So it's going to be a lot of fun. That's going to be more information is going to be coming up around uh, the end of the month, especially when we're going to launch and hopefully continue servicing Montgomery County here in Conroe. Uh, but right now, it's Meet the Candidates. If you know early voting starting today, if you need your polling location and times, visit mctx.org slash election. That's mctx dot org slash election we have jd lambright in the studio and if you didn't read the conroe Cur- courier today i think it was today or it might have been yesterday they uh, i keep saying enforced but that's not the right way uh, they not only endorsed him, endorsed that's did, the word yeah did you get a chance to read the whole article yeah I sh- no i mean i normally don't either but i normally they say blah 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 we endorsed blah blah holy cow 
Did your brother work at the Courier? They they strongly urged people to go out and vote for him. I think the wording was, we strongly urge you to vote for him. J.D., tell us more about that. That was I don't think I've ever seen them endorse somebody that strong. I, I don't think I have either. I was uh, very pleased and very honored to get that endorsement, uh, and, and particularly when I read it, because frequently, and you look at a lot of the endorsements, uh, the, the Courier and other media sources do, uh, and the way that comes about, they uh, offer you an opportunity to interview with them. It's their three-person editorial board. And you spend about an hour with that board. And, of course, they're also doing background you know, research and uh, how you've done. And, you know, they bring together a lot of sources. And then when uh, my endorsement came out in the Sunday paper, I think it was, and I was really taken aback of just how uh, positive it was. I, I joked with somebody. I said my mother wouldn't even have written a, a report that good about me, but really, what it is she's saying, on the line by the way she's talking there <laughs> uh, what it really is saying is not only the the leadership and things that we've shown, but the kind of people we've brought in, as I mentioned earlier, into each of these key areas that we work in, and that's what makes it all happen is surrounding yourself with the right people and that's the case as you well know, no matter what the job is, uh, whether it's county attorney or somebody running a plumbing business or anything else. Just get the best people, and that's what we've uh, certainly been able to do. That's actually a recurring theme, I feel, with all the constables and all, uh, especially uh, especially the constables, is their, their employers, or employees, I guess, or their coworkers or things like that, especially the strength of the organization is in them. Uh, with your, I guess, your reach, because it sounds like you do a lot more than just represent. Because that was interesting to find out that you are part. You said you're part of the prosecution for those uh, certain ages and things like that, uh, for the, for the county for younger age groups and those things like that. And with the improvement uh, of the county, do you see? Or sorry, what do you see as the future of the being a county attorney, and especially with the cases you're going to be handling? I know a big hot topic is police stuff because police apparently are the worst thing to happen to this country in a while but i i, I think that's that depends on the case but uh but you as a county attorney with your experience what do you see being a kind of theme or a trend happening in, in the county well w- one thing you mentioned at the outset just then was about the juvenile cases we prosecute and by statute in montgomery county the county attorney's office is responsible for prosecuting all the juvenile cases and as it currently stands the legislature defines what is a juvenile and as it currently stands in in the state of texas that are, are those are individuals from the ages of 10 through 16. So in other words, if you're 17 year olds, uh, 17 years old, maybe you're in high school, commit a crime, you're going to be prosecuted uh, by the district attorney's office, not the county attorney's office. Uh, I think there's a great chance we're going to see that change maybe in the next legislative session. They talked about it a lot this time is upping that age to 18 when you would go in the adult system. So if that happens, uh, it'll add a significant amount to our caseload because we'd prosecute from 10 years up through 17. Well, wouldn't that – sorry to interrupt, but wouldn't that kind of depend on the, like each county, depending on what the the flow of the cases would be? Or is that just – Texas just goes flat out, this is what's happening? That's, well, that, it's by statute. The legislature has determined that, and the legislature is the one that probably is going to make the change to up that age. And I can see some of the rationale for doing it. Let's Let's say – uh, you and a couple of buddies, uh, you're going to high school together, and y'all get in some sort of trouble. And uh, one of the guys happens to be 17, and the two guys happen to be 16, and maybe you're all in the same class together, and you get in the same kind of trouble. Well, that 17-year-old is going to be prosecuted in the adult system mm-hmm. uh, with some potentially significantly different consequences than the 16-year-old. And there's also uh, issues around, you know, there's there's still kids, if you will, at that point, uh, and it, we, we would still retain the ability, as we've done on a number of occasions in my office, to seek to have an individual uh, that is a juvenile certified to stand trial as an adult. And we've done that on several cases, Cases because the juvenile system is much more about rehabilitation. There's no question that young people, and sometimes not so young people, but young people in particular, do some rather stupid things. And you prefer not to make criminals out of them and, you know, really harm them for life. But we see a lot of the cases that are not that at all. Particularly, we have a lot of uh, aggravated sexual assault cases where we've got young juveniles, say 16 years old, 15 years old, committing some of the most heinous crimes 
that you could imagine on younger juveniles, uh, like a 16-year-old boy, perhaps, or it could be a girl, uh, you know, perpetrating on a six-year-old cousin. And we had one case like that, that just horrific case. And we charged that uh, that young man with 42 felony counts uh, of all these sex cases. And he was perpetrating on the six-year-old uh, uh, cousin, I think it was, that he was babysitting routinely. And we thought, this is not a case about rehabilitation. It has gone so far. So that's when we went to the judge uh, and had a hearing, which is the way you have to do it, and got that young man certified to stand trial as an adult, which then that means we hand that case over to the district attorney. And to give you an idea of the strength of the case we had against uh, that guy, uh, he ended up pleading guilty. By that time, he was 17, and he accepted a plea agreement for 50 years in prison. So uh, it shows you the seriousness of that. And one very important thing a lot of people don't understand on plea bargains, which are are very common, one key component of every plea bargain is you waive your right to appeal. So it gets finality in the case. That person can never appeal it. And and more importantly, it gives finality to the victim or the victims that it's not going to drag on and on and on for years in the appellate process. That's pretty impressive with the amount of casework you guys do. I know I've seen uh, someone from your office speak at one of the uh, luncheon I was at, and it's just amazing the impact you have on this county number-wise. Because uh, how many cases you'll handle, how many are juvenile cases. Because I think a lot of people who are just ju- general citizens don't know the day in, day out what goes on down the street over at the courthouse, and especially the involvement uh, you guys have from protecting and also enforcing what the laws here of Montgomery County. So uh, that's pretty neat to know, know everything about what you do. And as part of your reelection, I imagine it's not you're not going to be shy about what you've achieved in uh, your first term. That's exactly right. And people need to know what we're doing to help protect your family and protect our community. Just on the juvenile side that we've been talking about, we prosecute around 1,200 or 1,300 juvenile cases per year. And if the legislature makes the change, as I mentioned earlier, to uh, to increase that age of what what is a juvenile, uh, if you look statistically how many 17-year-olds the district attorney prosecutes, it would add around another 250 to 275 cases a year to our caseload, which right now is around 1,250, 1,300. And that's just on, you know, on the juvenile side. So I've, I, I think it's a high likelihood that the legislature will make that change in the coming session. So that's, that's, that's another 20%. That, that's, that's correct. Wow. So, so uh, not as though we're sitting around right now with nothing to do. We would have a tremendous amount. And, uh, and, and you know, per, clearly we, we've had tremendous number of successes in my first three years in office. But since we've talked so much about the juvenile, the one that just stands out far and above all the other ones is what I call the burning death case of a, then an eight-year-old boy, Robert, Robert Middleton. And that case happened back in 1998, uh, 15 years prior to my taking office. And uh, Robert, it was his eighth birthday, and his 13-year-old next-door neighbor doused him with gasoline and set him on fire. And the burns were so horrific, medical experts never thought he would live maybe an hour or two or m- make it through the night. And somehow he managed to live almost 13 years. He died shortly before his uh, 20th birthday. So I never had an opportunity to meet Robert Middleton. Uh, But the county attorney's office never prosecuted that case, and it would fall to the county attorney because the perpetrator was 13 years old. And when uh, actually before I took office, I started having meetings and met with the family and so forth. And I, I remember so vividly like it was yesterday, I told them I would rather step up to the plate and strike out than never to step up to the plate at all, which means I want to give you your day in court, give your son's memory the day in court. So uh, I reopened that case early in my first uh, first year and the uh, turned it over to the cold case squad at the sheriff's office and the most incredible investigative job you could imagine. And they spent about seven months leaving no one's no stone unturned in that case. And then I personally filed the capital murder charges against the perpetrator, who by now was 28 years old. And a lot of people wonder, well, why was my office involved in that by that time? Because he's 28. He's not a juvenile. But by statute, since he was a juvenile when he committed it, the case is still in juvenile court. And so we had a full-blown three-day trial or certification hearing 
and we had to uh, convince the judge, given the nature of this crime and everything, to certify that now 28-year-old to stand trial as an adult in the adult system. And at the end of that three-day trial, the judge agreed with us. So that meant that we handed the case over to the district attorney. But the district attorney immediately requested in writing that, that me and my chief prosecutor stay on the case because they knew we knew every aspect of that case. And we had started preparing for the appeal of that case from day one. So we sat alongside and worked with the DA's office in prosecuting the case against Don Collins, who was the perpetrator. It got transferred to Galveston on a change of venue. We had a full-blown seven-day trial in Galveston in front of a jury, and the jury uh, came back with a sentence of 40 years. And I've heard a lot of people say, well, gosh, why only 40? Why not life or why not death or something? That's because the age that he was when he committed at 13, the maximum he could get was 40, and, and that's, that's where it ended up. Uh, that case, as expected, was immediately appealed to the Beaumont Court of Appeals, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and uh, right at that same time, the district attorney asked us to actually handle the appeal on it because I have an incredibly talented uh, appellate lawyer that's the chief of my juvenile division. So we are handling uh, the appeal on that case under the name of the district attorney's office, but we are doing that. And we expect a ruling to come down uh, within the next 60 days on that case. And hopefully the, that young man will stay in prison where he belongs. Uh, but so far we've had him locked up in uh, uh, in confinement for three years now. So he's not out there hurting other, other boys. And, and by the way, the reason this whole thing happened is a few days before he doused him with gasoline, this 13-year-old had sexually assaulted the 8-year-old. And so he set him on fire to try to cover that up. I guess he never thought he would live, but somehow he did. So now, that's the proudest moment I've had in office. It truly is an incredible story. I remember following it in the papers and everything like that, especially the change of venue. I, wonder, I remember when I read that, and I kind of go, I wonder how this whole legal system really works. Because you actually traveled with a lot of people. Like, you traveled. You went over to Galveston to handle this case. So it's like you're not just the county, the county attorney is, and you stay in the borders. You work for the people here and for long term. So that's a great example of what you're able to do as the county attorney. We're sitting with J.D. Lambright, your current county attorney. who's looking for re-election. Get out and vote, folks. Go online right now to find a polling locations, mctx.org slash election. We're going to take a quick break. I'm sitting with Nathan Arizani of Montgomery County Lifestyle. We'll be back with J.D. Lambright after the sponsorship messages. All right, that's Pat Green's doing Wow. I was away. Sitting here for Meet the Candidates. We're here every Monday through Friday with Nathan Arizani talking about voting, folks. Early voting is starting today. MCTX.org slash election to find out polling times and locations. Uh, Montgomery County Lifestyle and Nathan Arizani are also promoting everything. Get all, get everyone to know the candidates, and that's also part of this segment on Mornings and Lone Star. It's a special segment, so he won't be here forever, which is sad. But we'll always be here when there's voting coming up. <laughs> right now, our special guest this morning is J.D. Lambright. He's your county attorney. You can visit him online right now at mctxcao.org. That's the official county attorney's website and see what they do over there and what they do for us as a, a citizen in the county. So we didn't do this, though, is we didn't get to know J.D. We, we, we know how great he is at his job. I mean, that's cool and everything. But I want to know who J.D. is, where he came from. Are you even a lawyer? I mean, you, you say you're a lawyer, but, like, where would you go to school and things like that? So you don't mind, J.D. Let us know a little bit more about you. A absolutely. Uh, well, I grew up in the uh, Texas Panhandle. I was born and raised and lived in Texas my entire life, little town of Pampa up near Amarillo. Uh, and that's where I met my years later, t t what became my wife. We started dating in high school. She tells everybody she raised me from a puppy, which <laughs> is probably true. Nathan, Nathan knows her. Uh, so I graduated from high school in Pampa, and then I really had an interest and a passion uh, for anything electronics at that time. So I moved to Lubbock and went to Texas Tech University and got a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. And then I stayed on two more years at Tech and got a master's in electrical engineering and uh, ended up getting a, had a number of job offers, but I accepted a job with Shell Oil Company in Houston as an electrical engineer slash geophysicist. And back in those days, most of the geophysicists they hired did not have geophysical degrees uh, because of what was being taught in the university at that time in geophysics. So most of them were electrical engineers because a lot of the principles are the same. So I did that for uh, 25 years. I worked on projects uh, all over the world, uh, all over the United States, both onshore and offshore, 
and uh, numerous places around the world. I was always headquartered in Houston, but uh, did, did a lot of traveling those days. And back when I was finishing up my master's, uh, I took an elective course, uh, a business law course as an elective. Uh, and it was so different than anything I'd ever taken from physics and calculus and math and engineering. And I, I really enjoyed it. But I had a great offer from Shell, so I went to work for Shell. And I uh, kept thinking about that during the course of that, that 25 years I was w- with Shell. So eventually I started law school uh, nights and weekends while I was working for Shell. And uh, I finished law school and then stayed on with Shell and finally decided, you know, if I'm going to change careers, uh, I don't want to wait till I'm, you know, 90 years old to do that. So I uh, uh, took early retirement in 99, 1999. As I mentioned, I had 25 years with Shell at that time. And then the next day, I opened my law practice right here in downtown Conroe in the Conroe Tower. And that's what I did for 13 years, uh, really handling most any kind of case, uh, criminal cases, civil cases, family, juvenile, a little of everything, a solo practitioner with a legal assistant. And then uh, eventually ran for office, and uh, now I've been in this office for three years. So that's kind of kind of how we got there. I'm glad you're here. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Right? It's amazing the the paths people take to get to where they are today. And you're continuing running for re-election for the county attorney's office. And I imagine, uh, if I'm allowed to talk about this, we only have a couple more minutes. But uh, after, say you do win, and you know you're confident that you will win. Is there anything else go- in your mind about Montgomery County that you want to want to do personally, or see grow, or things like that? Well, certainly, uh, if I'm reelected, and we're very confident about our position, I, you know, I am opposed in this election. But uh, just to continue to do the good things we've been doing and, and help uh, our county, help our county officials, our department heads, uh, to do the right thing and keep this county on the right path. Uh, people love to come to Montgomery County, as we all know by the growth, and it keeps putting in increased demands on my office. Uh, because there's all sorts of things that we get involved in. Uh, like, you know, there's an extension going on at the moment of League Line Road, extending that. Well, we don't operate the road graders or anything, but my office handled the acquisition of all the right-of-way to build that. Uh, the uh, customs facility, for example, that's being built at our uh, local airport, we were heavily involved in that. Again, a lot of the agreements, the contracts, uh, negotiations going on, airport leases, we we get involved in a lot of those things, uh, and continue to represent the county in in the best fashion possible. Uh, in particularly, I, I cannot emphasize enough on the law enforcement side. We see how law enforcement is handled and treated so many areas around the country. And fortunately, you don't seem to see that in Texas, and certainly not in Montgomery County. And so, when our law enforcement uh, officers, our sheriff, whomever, our constables get sued, uh, then it's my office's responsibility to defend them. Most of those suits are in federal court in Houston because uh, the uh, the criminals always complain and their civil rights were violated, uh, you know, some nature like that. So that puts those cases in federal court. And we really committed during my campaign to bring in the right kind of people to defend those. And we drastically changed our litigation section. Uh, just one e- example of that, uh, there was a, a lady that filed suit against uh, the county for several million dollars and sued some of our law enforcement, I think also sued the sheriff. Uh, she had been at a bar in the Woodlands and got extraordinarily intoxicated, and there were a couple of off-duty sheriff's deputies working there and trying to get her to leave, trying to get her a ride home and so forth. And she wouldn't hear of it, and she would leave the bar for a while and come back in. And uh, so at one point, she was trying to leave, and so she was being arrested because they just could not let her go out on the streets well then not all that much longer here comes a federal lawsuit against our law enforcement claiming she was beat up and that she suffered permanent brain damages and uh, we investigated that case thoroughly since she was claiming these medical damages we hired medical experts to review her medical records uh, and she was asking at the outset for millions of dollars in damages and everything in our investigation turned up. There was nothing our law enforcement had done improperly, starting from the booking photos when she was booked in jail. There were no injuries on this lady. And what it turned out to be, while while her husband would be out of town traveling, she would go to various bars and uh, and end up hooking up with guys. And then when her husband would come home, that's how she got beat up. 
And so we got all those 911 calls, got her medical records. And so, yeah, she suffered some injuries, but it was after this event here. So we vigorously pursued that case, fought that case for a year and a half. And as it got closer and closer to trial, her demands kept coming down and coming down. Uh, eventually, uh, we were down within a couple of weeks of trial, and her millions of dollar demand had got down to forty thousand dollars. And we advised Commissioner's Court not to pay that. I mean, even though you could just do away with it, that uh, we felt very confident and we're ready to go try that case. And about a week or so before trial, the lady dismissed her case. So that tells you if we hadn't fought that case. And what what a lot of these attorneys on the outside depend on is go sue the government for, you know, a million dollars or five million dollars, and the government will cut you a check for a quarter million dollars or something just to go away. Well, that's not the reputation uh, that we want in this county, and that's what we've really tried to change. And, and the tiny bit of icing on the cake on that, because of some outside expenses we had incurred on some experts in that case, uh, we got a judgment against her for ten thousand dollars and that judgment has been paid and is back in the county coffers so i think law enforcement know we have their backs in fact you don't have to ask me just uh i'm not a police officer i've never been a cop uh, but uh montgomery county law enforcement association has endorsed me in this re-election and also another entity called the combined law enforcement association in texas which represents 20,000 police officers around the state they have endorsed me so uh, i think they know we have the backs, and we will staunchly uh, re- represent their officers. So that's just another example of the kind of things we do. J.D. Lambright's running for re-election of your county attorney. Voting started today, early voting started today, mctx.org slash election for all polling times and locations. Uh, J.D., thank you so much for coming in and letting us know what you're doing over at the county's office, especially why we should re-elect you here in Montgomery County. Nathan, thanks for coming in. Who's going to be here tomorrow? Tomorrow's Wednesday. Tomorrow is Jim Gentry and Duke Kuhn from the Talk About the City, and then Jim's going to talk about his uh, mayoral candidacy. All right, so hopefully you stick around. we got the Cindy Conquer Show coming up next uh, at 10 o'clock, so stick around. we got our Taking Song Requests on our Lone Star on Twitter and Facebook, and we'll be back shortly. Thank you for checking out a podcast on Lone Star Internet Radio. Lone Star Internet Radio is Montgomery County's community radio station, broadcasting from the heart of Conroe, Texas. If you are interested in sponsoring a program for Lone Star Internet Radio, just visit us online at IRLoneStar.com or message us on Facebook. We are always taking song requests on Twitter, and if you are interested in getting involved with the station, by either hosting your own show or if you want to be a DJ. Just contact Dick at dick at IRLoneStar.com. Lone Star Internet Radio, Montgomery County's community radio station.